What is the best form of exercise for fat loss? All right, well, we need to firstly address what we mean when we ask that question. We're basically saying which exercise modality will burn the most calories within a set period of time. So in order to answer this question, we're gonna look at three forms of exercise. We're gonna look at high intensity interval training, low intensity steady state cardio, and traditional strength training. All right, so just to quickly define um, these exercise modalities and give some examples. When we're talking about high intensity interval training, we're basically talking doing some form of exercise, and it can be any form of exercise to be honest. This, uh, this method can be applied to anything. You can apply it to traditional forms of cardio like swimming, cycling, running. You can apply it to various forms of strength training. It basically means just working for, for a short period of time and then resting for a short period of time. So having intervals of high intensity and then intervals of pretty much pure recovery. So when we're talking about something like cycling, you can think about a spin class, where you're adding some resistance, working your backside off for about 20, 30 seconds, and then you're gonna take about 20, 30 seconds rest, something like that. And then you can think about home workouts where you're doing exercises like burpees, where you're doing some form of um, body weight based exercise for a period of time, 30 seconds, a minute, and then you're gonna recover for a similar period of time. Or do it in the gym, uh, maybe a CrossFit style exercise like a thruster, where you're doing it under a higher amount of load, so you can do it for a certain number of repetitions, or you can do it for a certain period of time, and again, then take a brief period of recovery. It's a brief period of high intensity, followed by a period of pretty much pure recovery. Then, uh, low intensity steady state cardio would be your cycling, swimming, jogging, um, rowing, things like this, where you're just basically keeping that continuous steady state of intensity. So generally a moderate, moderate to low um, intensity throughout a certain period of time. So just jumping on the bike and just keeping your legs moving at the same pace under the same resistance for about 30, 40 minutes. And then traditional strength training. This is what I'm personally an advocate of, so I've got a slight bias um, within this, but my bias is built on uh, not just beliefs, but science. Um, anyway. Traditional strength training is just basically looking to improve strength and potentially hypertrophy, so muscle size. Just um, lifting a challenging load for a set number of reps. So for example, we're doing pull-ups, we're doing barbell bench press, we're doing squats, things like this. We're gonna do eight, 10 repetitions and you're gonna lift a weight that you can do for pretty much that number of reps. Maybe keep one, maybe two reps left in the bank. So pick a weight that you could do for about 12 reps, but absolutely no more, and perform it for about 10. To a degree, this is similar to high intensity interval training. Um, in the sense that you're gonna have a short period of time where you're working, and then you're gonna have a period of time where you're resting, okay? But the, uh, the work is generally not powerful, explosive movements that would really elicit a high heart rate response. But anyway, those are the three forms of exercise that we're gonna compare. Alright, so if we're simply going to look at the num total number of calories burned, um, HIIT's going to win. Your high intensity interval training is going to win, okay? But don't switch off just yet uh, because it's not as clear cut as that. So there's things to uh, consider. So there's been plenty of studies in this area and not cherry picking data, but this 2017 meta analysis, I'm pretty sure it was, um, compared moderate intensity to high intensity and found that. Um, total energy expenditure wasn't really any different apart from the fact that high intensity activity was able to achieve it in 40% less time, which kind of makes sense. If we take an activity, let's say like rowing, you jump on a rower for an hour and it takes you an hour to burn 500 calories, but if you do it at twice the speed, you're probably going to do it in pretty much half the time. Now it may not be that simple, but you get the idea of where I'm going. So working at higher intensity, we're having short periods to recover, um, you pretty much do the same amount of work in significantly less time. So although it would appear that um, high intensity exercise can be a big win in regards that it's a time saver, for, so for those individuals that feel that they're really short on time, working at a higher intensity rather than for a longer period of time at a lower intensity seems like a big win. There's also some other things to consider within that. So one is the fact that intensity, that's going to be very individualized from one person to another. So some people have got the ability to take themselves mentally to a place of pain. So they're able to work at such an intensity that they are considering, they are working at a state that we would consider to be a high intensity. But one person's perception of what's high compared to another person's can be very different. 
some people just struggle to take themselves to that place mentally. So they can do a high intensity interval workout, but if they're performing it at a lower intensity, because they're performing exercises at a slower speed or with a significantly lower resistance, then it's not necessarily going to be what we would consider or what the research would consider to be high intensity. So it could actually be moderate intensity training and you're doing it for a short period of time and therefore not necessarily getting the reward that you expect. And if you think about it, it's pretty simple, it kind of makes sense. If you think of various forms of intensity, just pretty much burning more calories and just to throw some arbitrary, I don't know if I pronounce that correctly, numbers at the uh, situation, let's say that high intensity will burn 15 calories per minute. Let's say moderate intensity will burn 10 calories a minute and low intensity will burn 5 calories a minute. If you and then rest pretty much zero, even though technically you still burn calories when you're resting, but just for argument's sake, let's say zero. If you work at high intensity for a minute, you're going to burn 15 calories. If you then rest for a minute, you're going to burn zero. So over a two minute period, you're going to burn 15 calories. Whereas if you burn, if you work at moderate intensity, and then followed by a low intensity and do those kind of intervals, you can still hit the same number of calories. If you work constantly at a low intensity for those two minutes, you're going to burn the same, potentially more. You get the idea. So it's, it's all about the average. If you can work at a high intensity pretty much one stop, then you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. But again, like I said, that depends from one person to another on their ability and what they perceive to be a high intensity. All right, but intensity aside, one big selling point, which is often or pretty much always overblown, is um, the afterburn effect. So burning more calories after you've completed the exercise. So not just being able to burn a significant amount of cal calories in a short period of time, but then continue to burn calories hours after you've finished exercising. It sounds fantastic, which is why it helps sell this training modality. However, it is pretty, uh, pretty well overblown. So we're referring to EPOC. Excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Right. Basically, all we're talking about is elevating your metabolism as your body tries to get back down to normality, as it tries to get back down to a state of homeostasis post-exercise. The longer it takes to do that, the more calories you're going to burn in that period. So you can do a 20 minute workout, 30 minute workout, high intensity, where you burn a good amount of calories. Then depending on how high the intensity is and how much you can push yourself, your afterburn effect is elevated for hours once you finish exercising and therefore you continue to burn more calories at rest than you normally would. So the health and fitness industry, they like to do this. They like to take a little bit of truth and then blow it out of proportion in order to sell whatever they're trying to sell. And this is uh, an example. Um, but just to preempt this, even though my bias lies with strength training, strength training does this as well, and I'll come to that in a second. So, um, this 2006 uh, recent re this 2000, no, I still can't say. This 2006 research review highlights the fact that only six to 15 percent of the net total oxygen cost of the exercise came from the epoch effect, meaning that pretty much everything, all of the oxygen cost, basically all of the calories burned, are going to be coming from the exercise itself. And it's only those that are able to really train with that high intensity that are going to get any benefit from the epoch, epoch effect. And then even then, it's really not going to last as long as we feel that it, as long as it is sold to us. Okay. So basically, the afterburn effect, which applies to every form of exercise, but is just generally more from high intensity exercise than any other, is still only going to last for a short period of time. All right. So just to quickly summarise here. The positives are mainly from the fact that people tend to enjoy it. It gives you that dopamine hit, it, it, may, it gives you that release of uh, adrenaline, and people enjoy the exercise itself, and if you enjoy something, you're probably going to adhere to it and sustain it, and it could be a part of your lifestyle going forward, and therefore, um, that's a positive reason to do it. Also, generally done in groups, uh, which gives people that sense of community, which um, is a massive appeal to people, gives some form of social aspect to the exercise as well, which is another major plus. However, in order to actually get any form of big calorie um, benefit from it, you do need to work at high intensity. And with high intensity comes generally a high level of fatigue and a high level of stress. We create stress to the body with any form of exercise, but the more stress you create, the more stress you have to recover from. The higher, um, the more fatigue you create, the higher the risk of injury during the exercise itself as well. So you have to weigh up the risk versus the reward. 
So yes, we can burn more calories doing this form of exercise than anything else. Um, however, how much are we actually burning and how much is that in the bigger picture? We'll cover that in a second. You're getting some form of enjoyment out of it, which is arguably the most important um, reason to do it. And you're gonna get some form of community because generally this is an exercise that's done in a group setting, um, unless you're doing it at home, in your front room, in front of the TV. Um, so personally, I think there's a place for it, but I, uh, I think it should just be part of the uh, big picture. Okay, if you get into the gym four or five times a week, maybe even three, four times a week, then one, two hit classes uh, max would be beneficial. Um, but then there's, uh, there's things you should have in place before considering this. All right, so let's have a quick look at low intensity steady state. All right, well, clearly there's a very low injury risk. You get a increase in your aerobic capacity, so an increase in your cardiovascular fitness, so there's another tick in the box there. You're gonna burn calories. You're gonna burn more calories doing low intensity steady state cardio than you're gonna do when you're lifting weights, so there's another tick in the box there. Um, however, for a lot of people, it can be a little bit tedious and a little bit boring. You're by yourself on a treadmill, just jogging for 30 minutes, or you're, um, or you're sitting on the rower, moving your legs on the, uh, on the bike, checking your phone, watching the TV in front of you. You don't really get a huge amount of enjoyment from it. Some do, most don't. You don't um, get any sense of community from it, so positives and negatives, I'm not a big fan. And finally, let's quickly have a look at uh, strength training. So strength training isn't necessarily a form of exercise that most people will do in order to actively burn calories, because you're going in with a different objective. When you're on a elliptical and you're just doing some low intensity steady state, what you are trying to do, you're trying to burn fat, you're trying to Use that substrate as a form of energy for the body just to decrease the amount that you carry. You're just moving constantly in order to just simply burn energy. And similarly with HIT, although you're going to use a different energy supply for high intensity work, you're still moving as much as you can with the overall objective for most people, just to burn as many calories as possible. That's not necessarily the case for most people when they're doing strength training, they're doing it to increase the strength and the size, the density and the firmness of a muscle to, to create more shape to their physique. And I'm guessing that most people that are fat focused, when you drop that excess body fat, you want some shape to your physique, so you're gonna want some muscle there. So you gotta make sure you send the right signal to that muscle. So you wanna strength train, you want to lift a challenging weight for a specific number of reps within that strength hypertrophy phase, within that six to 12 rep range, generally. So any fat loss that comes from strength training, any calories burned that come from doing a strength-based workout should just be seen as a bonus. So a big selling point for strength training when it comes to fat loss is how it boosts your metabolism. Okay, I hear this a lot in my space, and I'm an advocate of strength training. Um, it's where my bias lies, but um, I don't like it as a tool for fat loss. No exercise should really be used as a tool for fat loss. Exercise should be used for any form of enjoyment, to increase your strength, increase your cardiovascular health, things like this, not to actively burn calories. And when we talk about increasing your lean muscle tissue in order to carry more muscle mass and burn more calories at rest, the numbers we're talking about are so small it's unbelievable. So when we look at your basal metabolic rate, as we have done previously or as we are about to go into, muscle only burns about 13 calories per kilo of weight per day. Which means that if you are new to the gym, within your first year you might put on 5 kilos of lean mass, maybe as much as 10 if you nail everything properly, train at a sufficient intensity and support that with the adequate nutrition. Um, but after that, year after year, it gets less and less. Um, because we've all got a genetic potential on the amount of lean muscle we can pack on. And even if you manage to put on 10 kilos of lean mass within one, two, three years, however long it takes, that's a substantial amount of muscle that if people don't see you from the moment you start working out to the moment you put on that 10 kilos, they'll think, wow, what the fuck have you been doing? Um, but even though, even then, that's only gonna be an additional 130 calories a day, which is nothing which over the course of a week is what, just over 900 calories? It's, uh, it's really not gonna make much of a difference to your total daily energy expenditures. The amount of calories these workouts are gonna burn is gonna vary massively from person to person. The intensity is gonna differ from one person to the other, and you can't compare a five foot female to a six foot four male, because their energy demands are massively different. So you can't really say a weight training session is gonna burn X amount compared to a hit training session. However, let's just throw some random numbers out that may be accurate but possibly won't be and I'll do it for myself. So I'm going to guess that when I do a one hour um, strength training session, I'm probably going to burn about 300 calories. If I do a 60 minute 
um, low intensity steady state cardio session, it may be, let's say 500. That might be pushing it. And if I do a 30 to 40 minute HIIT workout, because you're gonna to struggle to do that level of intensity for 60 minutes, and generally HIIT workouts are a lot short, shorter, um, it's probably just gonna be around 600 calorie mark. Because again, I'm condensing the time, I'm reducing the amount of time of movement, even at higher intensity. It's not gonna to be too much more than the low intensity steady state stuff. It's just a bit more time efficient. All right, so let's have a look at that throughout the overall day, and more importantly, over the course of a week. Okay, so let's say that I need 2,500 calories to maintain my current body weight, okay? For me personally, it's more than 3,000 mark, but let's work on the average guy, which will be about 2,500. So 2,500 calories, 70% of the calories I use on a daily basis are going to come from my basal metabolic rate or my resting metabolic rate. These are the most basic metabolic functions the body needs to survive on a daily basis. And just to throw some numbers at this, um, I'm going to have a look at my computer because I've got them written down. All right, so your liver burns 200 calories per kilo of weight per day. Your brain, 240, your heart, 400, and your kidneys, 400. Now compare that to muscle, which is only 13 calories per kilo per day, and fat, which is 4.5. Oh no, sorry, take that back. Yeah, sorry, I got that right. Fat, which is only 4.5 calories per kilo per day. So just on a daily basis, lying down in bed, my muscle will only take 13 calories per kilo per day, as opposed to my kidneys that we use 400. And that is why the majority of my calories throughout the day are going to come from my basal metabolic rate or my resting metabolic rate, which is 70% of my total burn, 70% of my 2,500 is 1,750. Okay, so that leaves 750 calories. About approximately 10% will come from a thermic effect of food, so when I'm chewing, digesting my meals, when I'm absorbing the nutrients and metabolizing the food that I eat, that will take about 10%, which will be about 250 calories which means my non-exercise activity thermogenesis, my NEAT, the amount of energy my body uses to do things like this, hand gestures when I'm talking, speaking, volume speed, um, sorry, volume speed, um, my talking speed, my volume of speech, um, blinking, things like this, but as well as that, it's the energy that you use, you do your domestic chores, and simply walking around the house, things like this. Um, so on a non-exercise day, that's basically where my calories go. 500 to my knee, 250 to my thermic effect food, and 1750 to my basal metabolic. Okay, so playing with the numbers that we said earlier, let's say I do a high intensity interval training session and I've got 600 calories. Okay, now how many hit sessions am I, am I doing a week? And true hit sessions where I'm going to get a good six, maybe even 700 calorie burn. Three, four, okay? Even if it's as many as four, then we're looking at about, what, 2400 calories? which let's be honest, I'm not sure many people are getting to the gym four times a week and doing a true high intensity session, but if they are, that's 2,400. Now without doing anything, if I don't go to the gym at all, I'm going to burn 2,500 a day through my BMR, my needs, and my thermic effect of food. That alone is a total of 17,500 a week. So an additional 2,400 isn't a huge amount, and that's being generous. It'd be far easier just for me to increase my needs and just move around the house more, go for the odd walk and decrease my calorie consumption than it is to bust my ass in the gym and do some form of high intensity training session. Another thing we have to think about when we do HIT is the impact it can have on your needs. If you go to the gym and if you bust your ass in spin class, the chances are when you get home you're going to sit on that sofa. You're not going to go straight into the garden and start doing some gardening. You're not going to go up and down stairs tidying the house and do some laundry. Whereas if you do a steady state, um, a low intensity steady state session on the elliptical, or if you do a, uh, a moderate intensity strength training session, you're going to have more energy to do more work around the house when you get back, and therefore burn more calories when you're at home. So make sure that you're maximizing or even increasing that need. Right, so this is why we should not look to exercise to create that calorie deficit. Because it's all about energy in versus energy out. And if you're Getting a decent amount, or the majority, the large, not, the, not just the majority, the large majority, probably 90% of your energy expenditure from your resting metabolic rate, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, and your thermic, thermic effect of food. So 90% of your weekly calorie burn is going to come from not going to the gym and exercising. Then it makes sense just to make sure that you eat below that threshold. 
that if you can not exercise and you're still going to burn 17,500 calories a week, then just consume 15 to 16,000 calories a week and you're going to create that deficit. Rather than consuming 17,500 and then trying to burn an additional 2,400 by doing your four hit workouts a week just to impact your energy balance and create that calorie deficit. And final area of concern with HIT, and yeah, I am shitting on HIT a little bit, okay? Um, it's how it can affect your hormone production. Okay, so if we just focus on two hormones, if we just focus on testosterone and uh, cortisol. So testosterone is, uh, is, te is often referred to as the male hormone, but women have testosterone levels as well, which are important, and both men and women want to maximize, or should want to, maximize their natural testosterone production. Cortisol plays a lot of roles in the body. It's known as a stress hormone but excess cortisol or chronic levels of cortisol can be detrimental and we don't want too high levels of cortisol. Cortisol naturally um, rises as we, as we sleep, wakes us in the morning and it's high in the morning and should decrease as the day goes on. We live in a world now where we've got huge amount of stresses. You can have stress from your work, you can have stress from your family, you can be stressed when you're stuck in traffic in the car and things like this. All of these things can add to that total stress bucket and the total level of cortisol that you have um, in the body. Now, although strength training and low intensity steady state might elevate that cortisol slightly, high intensity interval training is going to elevate it far more. And the one can impact the other. So if your cortisol is elevated, it can affect things like your sleep. And poor sleep can affect your testosterone production. So the worse you sleep, the lower your testosterone. And what do you want high testosterone? Well, testosterone is an anabolic hormone. It's an anabolic to muscle, which means it builds it up, which is a positive thing. It's what we want to achieve to shape our physique, but also for Health, general health purposes and longevity and things like this, um, high quality of life when you're older. But testosterone, as well as being anabolic to muscle, it's catabolic to fat, it breaks fat down. So we want to maximize our natural testosterone production because we want to go to the gym, lift some weights, build our muscle and decrease our body fat. Whereas cortisol is pretty much the opposite. It's catabolic to muscle and it's anabolic to fat. And that's not necessarily what we want, that's the opposite of what we want. We don't want our, our cortisol levels to be too high and to to break down muscle tissue and potentially store fat. However, the, I am merely speculating here, but this is all dependent on the a individual's personal situation. If you're a 20 year old, male or female, living at home, low stress, no mortgage to worry about, no financial stress, no children waking you, making sure you've got perfect sleep, no kids to worry about and stress you out every evening, um, then you're in a very different situation to a 35, 40 year old individual the hormone profile is slowly starting to decline. They're struggling to get consistent sleep because they've got their children waking them every night. That has a mortgage to worry about, that has bills to pay, and that has a family to support. These are two very different situations. So if you're a 20-something that enjoys hit, then go for it. But if you're a 40-something that needs to manage their stress levels, that needs to focus on building their muscle and maintaining their hormone profile, then strength training, would be my go-to. Yes, that's where my bias lies, but that's also what logically makes sense. There's no harm in doing the odd hit session, but it shouldn't be the core of your training. Focus on strength, focus on getting strong, and decrease your excess body fat by dropping your calories and creating a caloric deficit from your food rather than from your exercise. All right, so let's just give a quick summary. All right. I'm not a big fan of low intensity steady state cardio just because I think that anyone to find the time to get to the gym, walk on the treadmill, no. Your time can be better spent elsewhere. If you're going to go to the gym, you need to spend your time lifting weights. You need to invest in your strength because it's the thing that is going to hold the most value to you as you go. If you want to get some form of low intensity steady state in, don't drive to the shops, walk instead. Focus on getting your total number of steps up for every day and increase that non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Do more movement around the house, do some domestic chores and tick some jobs off that to-do list. High intensity interval training, there are health benefits to it as well, okay? Uh, but I do it sparingly. If you, if you can get to the gym three times a week, you're doing well. And if two of them are strength training sessions and one of them is high intensity interval training, go for it. If you enjoy your hit, do it. But just be conscious that you might not be burning them as many calories as you think, that there is an increased injury risk compared to other forms of activity and what it can do to your overall stress management and how that could potentially, potentially affect your uh, hormone profile. So if you're asking me what should you do, lift weights.